the gospel of the Lord. In this Protestant nation that we live in, it's not a Catholic country, of course, I hope you know that, where everybody keeps saying that, oh, you can be in any, it doesn't matter, you know, you can go to any type of church. Or it's the same thing, you know, this type of Christianity or this or that, you know, it's all the same. We're Catholic. Have you ever thought of that? It's not the Bible alone, you know. This thing of all you need is the Bible. As if Jesus was giving out Bibles. Saying, go and preach to all the nations. Here's a Bible. The Bible didn't exist until the year 382. There was no Bible for the first 350 years. When Jesus says, go and preach the gospel, he's saying, go and announce me. This thing of all you need is the Bible is not Catholic. We have to be reminded of that over and over again. That we need not just the Bible, but we need community. We need church. The Bible comes from the church, not the other way around. It's extremely important for us to get this, and I'm reminded of this every time I put on the alb that I'm wearing today, because it was made for me for my ordination by my grandmother. She made it by hand. And my grandmother doesn't read or write. She can't read a Bible. But she is the best Bible I have ever read. You may be the only Bible the people in your life will ever read. What kind of Bible are they reading? Not spewing Bible verses. Anybody can do that. All you need to do is confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and boom, you're done. Don't work that way. As Catholics, we believe in church, in community, first and foremost in our life. Imagine a couple after their marriage and the church is the, the bride of Christ. They sign their marriage certificate and then they go off their own way. They don't live together. The absentee husband might say, she knows how I feel about her. Here is the marriage license. We signed it. We are married. Personal feelings are nice and fine. But having a marriage is more than having your name on a marriage certificate. It is all about presence. There has to be presence. We have couples here who have been married. The Kistner, 73 years. I could go down the line. Uh, Carol and Wes are here today. I haven't seen you in a long time. What is it, 67? 68 years. Okay. And others. I could go down the pew by pew by pew. And one of the things is you always see them all together. Everywhere, doing things together.
Personal feelings are nice and fine. But it's all about presence. There has to be presence. Bodily presence. An absentee husband or wife is really no husband or wife at all. Love isn't love unless it is love that becomes present to the beloved. I know something about all of this. And I'm really tired of people saying, how can you speak about marriage? You're not married. Yes, I am. I'm married. I'm a married man. I'm married to the church. I'm not a single guy. That's, one, that's number one. Second, I, am, I was part of a family. I lived with my parents, not just with my parents, but with my grandparents. Hmm? You don't have to bite the donut to know that it's sweet. Hmm? <laughs> so don't go off and say, oh, yeah, you have to be married in order to know what's going on. You know, part of that is, as Catholics, we believe in the sacraments, and I'm ordained, have the sacrament of holy orders. The Holy Spirit is upon me in a special way. You have to, you know, in our faith, believe that the Lord works through the sacraments of the church. And the breakup of my parents' marriage happened when my mother left Poland and came to the United States and they were apart. No presence. That's what happens. You know, we are here in the United States and you know that I work predominantly with immigrants as an immigrant myself. What is the number one issue, the breakup of marriages in immigrants. People come here from Mexico or other countries or like from Poland, and many times it's the man who comes and he's got his wife in Mexico, but he's got somebody else here, and she's all surprised. <laughs> I mean, come on, you know. I love you. Hello. You know, that's nice. But you're not present. An absentee husband or wife is really no husband or wife at all. Love isn't love unless it is love that becomes present to the beloved. Here in Luke chapter 24, verse 15 of the road to Emmaus. We are told that Jesus joined the two disciples on the road and became present in person. He himself, in body, came and joined them. And in today's gospel, which is also Luke 24, we are in the aftermath of Easter when the Bible claims here that Jesus wasn't just raised from the dead, but that Jesus became present to the disciples. He came and stood among them. Look at my hands. I'm not a ghost, he says. What did he say to Thomas last week? Touch my wounds. Put your finger here. The gospel begins with the evangelist today telling us that these two were downcast and gloomy and sad and depressed, the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. And in his body, Jesus comes and joins them as he does right here today. 
That's why it's not just about the Word for us as Catholics, but it is about the Eucharist, Holy Communion, His presence, real presence. This strikes me, you know. Why would the evangelist Luke make it a point to say in his person he joins them? Not in the internet or Facebook or YouTube or FaceTime or smartphone form, but in bodily form. These so-called smartphones have made us really dumb as people. Real presence. Isn't this what we call Holy Communion? The Eucharist? The real presence of Christ? Real. There are a number of these Easter appearance stories and they all say he came and stood in their midst. Touch my wounds. Touch me. I am real. Put your finger here. Why? Because there's no presence that is not bodily presence. This stuff today about internet presence, email presence, texting presence, phone presence, phone time presence is all superficial, not real, not really present. Like the 88-year-old lady who called me before Easter and told me that her son decided this year to invite his mother to Easter dinner over Zoom. You can have Easter dinner with us over Zoom, but there is a 40-minute limit on the amount of time she could be with them via the Zoom dinner because he wouldn't pay for the extra time that you need on Zoom. Isn't that stupid? I mean, I've never heard of, of a more stupid thing. That's no Easter dinner at all, she says to me. What has our world come to? Zoom dinners? <laughs> what have we done to ourselves? Smartphones have made us so dumb, so stupid, foolish, as the Bible would say. The most sophisticated people are the dumbest ones. I can't tell you enough how my grandma, my illiterate grandma, who never went to school, is the smartest person I know. And why? Because she embodies God's presence to me. She embodies love to me. She is present to me. And I want to be present to her. We send people gifts, don't we? Material stuff. And that's what you have taught your children. When they have a birthday or before Christmas, it's all about the gifts. Whereas the real word for gift in English and in other languages is present. You know, we used to give presents. What is that all about? that I am your gift, not stuff. You know, when Adam and Eve were thrown out of paradise, they didn't get to take anything out of heaven because remember, they walked in heaven. They left naked, do you remember that? In their shame, they covered themselves. What was the one gift that God let Adam and Eve take out of heaven? Adam got to take Eve, and Eve got to take Adam. They became each other's piece of heaven. They were married. Are you a piece of heaven to the people around you? 
Sometimes, you know, instead of pieces of heaven, we are pieces of hell. The way we taste heaven is through the presence of the people in our life. We believe in the incarnation. We say that in the creed every time became incarnate. God became a body, flesh. You hear that, you know, chile con carne, carne from the Latin, flesh. And if you look at chile con carne, isn't it messy? That's why, you know, your families are messy. <laughs> Having a body is messy. Your marriages are messy. It's all messy. And yet, you wouldn't have it any other way. What would you be without the people in your life? God became flesh, bodily presence, not Zoom presence, not presence through stuff. We need a real kiss, a real touch, a real hug. Oh, how we have found this out in the course of this last year, haven't we? How much depression, internal death, suicide, mental death, and mental disorders over this isolation that was imposed on us. This is the real pandemic going on. People dying alone in hospitals and in nursing homes, not being able to hold their loved ones. I talked with a gentleman who had COVID and he was in the hospital in, and they had him in the in the hospital room and the doctor comes up to the door and wouldn't come in and and he, and the doctor says from the door <laughs> this was hilarious he says i he says from the door the doctor asks him how you doing and the guy is uh hooked up to a respirator okay can't talk and from the door <laughs> the doctor says how you doing and the guy's like he says gives him the middle finger and says F you. It's like, you know, what do you mean? I mean, you're like over there and I have a respirator hooked up and you're... God became flesh. Born among us in Bethlehem, this same God hasn't left us and is present to us in exactly the same way He was present with those same disciples. The same way. That's what we celebrate when we come to Mass. We call it the real presence of Christ. He is with us. The same way we believe as Catholics Body, blood, soul, and divinity right here. Now you understand why it's so important to celebrate our Catholicity, our Catholicism. Let me point out that Jesus came to them, not them to him. He came and stood among them. In other words, we don't come to Christ. He comes to us as he does right here. And each time we gather together, where two or three are gathered. In Luke's gospel, Jerusalem is the church. And the church is community. So when you come here, you are coming to Jerusalem. And in the Bible, Jerusalem is heaven. Heaven is community. Hell is isolation. Being by yourself. That's why you have to keep coming. Together. Emmaus. The road to Emmaus. Remember, the gospel starts off by saying the two disciples recounted what had taken place on the way. Because it's chapter 24, the road to Emmaus. 
read it on your own. And how Jesus was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. What's the breaking of the bread? The Eucharist, Mass. Huh? What is Emmaus? Emmaus was the Roman spa town in, those, in that area where they had the bathhouses. It was kind of a, like a Las Vegas, okay, where you went. Uh, Romans did all sorts of stuff in the bathhouses. Everybody had sex with everybody in those uh, places. And there was drunk, drunking, drinking parties. People got drunk. There was a lot of debauchery going on. And so they were going, the two disciples were 12 miles or kilometers from Jerusalem on their way to Emmaus, but notice they never made it to Emmaus because Jesus met them there on the road. He joined them as he joins us. And not only us, but those we love. He finds us, not that we find him. That's all over the Bible. He is after your children and your grandchildren. He's running after them wherever they are at. He won't let you and he doesn't let them make it to Emmaus. This whole thing that you only get out of church or faith what you put into it is baloney. It's wrong. We show up and Jesus does the rest because he loves us. He shows up. That's what counts. You did most of the work today. You know how? By just coming here. We show up and Jesus does the rest. Standing here in the real presence in our midst. Worship is worship when Jesus puts not something, but himself into it, which is what the Eucharist is. He does it all. That's how much he loves you. He comes to be with you. And he says, what does he say? Have you anything to eat? Isn't that what he said today to them? Have you anything to eat? You know, I think teenage boys have been quoting Scripture for all these generations and they didn't even know it. When they come home and say, have you anything to eat? Why does Jesus say that? Have you asked yourself that? Because before this story... He was giving them food, always making breakfast for them. All of you, I'm sure you know you are such great Bible readers, okay? You know, the church gave us the Bible at the Council of Carthage. It's a document that is produced by the Catholic Church, the Bible. It's interesting. Catholics produce the Bible and Protestants read it. <laughs> Don't make any sense, does it? We should be reading the Bible. Ignorance of the Bible is ignorance of Jesus. If you have been given the gift to be able to read, read. It's great. So why does Jesus say, have you anything to eat? Because he's saying now, I'm hungry. It's your turn. Now you give me something to eat. Who is it that is hungry? Who is it? It's the Jesus and the people around you, in your husband and wife, your children, your co-workers. Jesus is not something out there or someone floating around. That's why he's saying, I'm not a ghost. I'm someone. And that somebody, body, huh? is all the people around you. He is still hungry. He's saying, give me food. You know, when I was in the seminary and every single Saturday, I went to a homeless shelter and I'm in the car 
with one of my friends and we're going and my phone rings and I pick it up and I say, hello, and it was another friend and he says, what are you doing? And I say, I say to him, we, me and the other guy that was in the other seminarian that was in the car with me, we are going to the homeless shelter to feed the homeless. We are going to the homeless shelter to feed the homeless. And at that, he stops the car, yanks the phone, shuts it down. And I said, what are you doing? What'd you do that for? And he says, you are not going to the homeless shelter to feed the homeless. You feed dogs. Okay? You feed dogs. You serve people. You feed animals. You serve people. And I know all of you are saying, you know, right now, oh yeah, Father, you know, you, you, you're so right. I see it right now, okay? You have, you're so right. And your husband comes home from work. What do you say to him? Sit down. I'm going to feed you. <laughs> and then it's not even a homemade meal. You picked it up at the jack-in-the-box. <laughs> or the four ninety nine Costco chicken. Well that that would be good. I bet you some of you, you know, just a dollar fifty hot dog. <laughs> huh? We serve people, all the people around us. Jesus is trying to show us today that he is really real. Ghosts do not eat halibut. Hmm? He has a physical body right now. Look around. Your body is Jesus' body. Paul says we are the body of Christ. All the people around you, that's Jesus around you. Stop looking out there, you know. That's easy. Anybody say, oh, I love you so much. Oh, Jesus, you're just wonderful. Now, that's great. But it's another thing to love Jesus in your husband or wife or your children, or all the people, your co-workers, everybody around you, because people betray you, they hurt you. Huh? But that's the test of Christianity. Whether I love God in the people around me. Read the second reading today. Huh? What did it say? Huh? Let me remind you all. My children, I am writing this to you so that you may not commit sins. The way we may be sure that we know Him is to keep His commandments. And His commandments are what? Love God with all your heart, all your soul, and your neighbor. And your neighbor. They go hand in hand together. The gospel is a rite of passage for the first disciples. And it should be a rite of passage for us. So Jesus is saying to you today, I am hungry. He is the teenage son or teenage grandson and your husband coming home from work or the neighbor who is alone and needs an invite for dinner or the people you know who need company. He is the one saying, have you anything to eat around here? I am hungry, says Jesus. That's the cry from the cross. I thirst. Whatsoever you do, Matthew 25, to those around you, you do to me, says Jesus. Huh? Oh Lord, when did we see you hungry? When did we see you naked or in prison or in a hospital? Whatever you did to these people, the least of these, you did to me. You understand that? Paul, in his conversion story on the road to Damascus, is blinded and Jesus speaks to him. And Paul, before he was Paul, he was Saul. And he was murdering Christians. 
Remember that? He was there at the, at the murder of the first Christian martyr, Stephen. The Acts of the Apostle tells us. And Jesus speaks to him. And what does he say? Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now, who was he persecuting? The church, the Christians, because Jesus equates himself with us. We are Jesus. You are Jesus. You understand that? It's the example of the greatest saint of our time, Mother Teresa. When a reporter asked her, when she was tending the wounds of the lepers, taking care of the untouchables, and what the reporter asked her, it's that reporter that put her out into the world, the BBC reporter, that documentary called Something Beautiful for God. If you haven't seen it, I recommend you, you see it. And he asked her in that report he says i wouldn't do he says to mother teresa i wouldn't do what you are doing for a million dollars and she looked at him and says well i wouldn't either but i do it for christ i do it for christ and you who do you do it for A million dollars? Or do you do it for Christ? Remember, you may be the only Bible those around you will ever read. What are they reading? <laughs> 